Jane Knuth seems like a very orderly person, or she used to be. She was a wife, a mother, and a part-time math teacher at a Catholic school in Michigan. Her life was fairly predictable and well-ordered. And then she walked into a St. Vincent de Paul thrift store in Kalamazoo and let them talk her into volunteering there. That was more than 15 years ago. In the years that has passed, she recruited new volunteers, streamlined how things were done, reorganized very, some facets of the store. But mostly, she's had her life transformed by the customers who come into the thrift store. She has learned that the great gift of serving the poor and marginalized is that when we serve the poor, they end up helping us as much as we help them. Jane grew up in Kalamazoo and is accompanied today by her husband, Dean. Back there in the back, welcome, Dean. She has been honored in many ways, including last year she received the Bishop's Award given in the, in the name of all the bishops who have ever served the Diocese of Kalamazoo. Jane makes it clear that it is not our perfection, but our humanity that makes us available to serve those on the margins. She shows us that working with the poor is not gloomy and depressing, but a spiritual path that leads us directly to the heart of Jesus. Please help me welcome Jane Knuth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, coming here today. I'm very honored to be at Creighton University. Um, when Maureen and Andy um, asked me to come to Omaha, they asked me to give a Lenten reflection, and I was pretty sure I wasn't qualified for that because I don't do Lent that well. Um, after all, it seems like this is the place that I would come to do Lent, right? Not the thrift store in Kalamazoo. Um, as a volunteer at a thrift store, we, we sort old clothes, we, um, we give out day-old bread, we listen to people's problems, um, we try to help them with their electric bills that are overdue, or with their rent if they're being evicted, and it's pretty ordinary troubles of the day kind of stuff. Um, so Lenten reflections, we usually never get there. We never talk about fasting, and we don't talk about preferential option for the poor. We don't use those kinds of words. Um, it's, it's pretty much roll up your sleeves kind of Christianity that we do. Um, so I just thought about this for a while, and I thought about my personal Lenten practice, and what I do every year is I give up speeding. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm not a terrible speeder. I don't crash into houses or anything. But I go a little bit over because I'm usually trying to get somewhere and get something done. And, and, I, and I thought about that. Um, I've given it up for about five years in a row. I'm still a speeder. But um, being a, a member of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, St. Vincent de Paul the priest that we're named after, he, he had something to say about speeding, actually. And I'm going to read a little quote. This, he says, Take care not to spoil God's work by trying to hurry. Too often, we spoil good works by going too fast. What God wishes done is accomplished almost by itself, without our thinking about it. Do the good that presents itself to be done. I do not say we should go out indiscriminately and take on everything, but rather those things God lets us know he wants of us. So that's St. Vincent of Paul. So speeding is, is what he's warning about, going too fast to do a good work. But the trick of this, this quote is, what does God let us know he wants us to do? That's the hard part. How do we discern that? And that's where the Jesuits come in, right? They're all about discernment. How do you figure that out? Um, fasting and prayer and speeding, um, how do we know? How, do, how is that going to help us fix, fix ourselves in these, this journey of Lent? Well, I'll tell you a story, 
And that's pretty much all I do in the book, is I just tell stories. These stories were gifts to me. As, as Maureen said, I was a math teacher. I'm not a writer. I'm, I was just a math teacher. And when these stories started happening, and I started telling people about them, I started writing them down. Because people needed to know what was going on. And, and that's where I learned to write, just writing these stories down. And the first one I'm going to tell is, it involves my husband, Dean. And he was, um, he drives the pickup truck to uh, pick up the donations that people give us. And that's good because he doesn't speed. And Jeremy is a, a young man who, who would help sometimes. We would usually call up the uh, Catholic high school in town when we, we needed some, some people to help. We, we, there's, quite a, there's probably a dozen or more kids at any given time that will help us with these picking up donations. So one Friday, Dean calls me up and he says, or actually we were home together, and he says, oh, I just got a great donation that I'm going to pick up tomorrow. It's um, 12 refrigerators. And I said, 12 refrigerators? Who's giving us 12 refrigerators? And he goes, well, the paper mill, the last one in town's closing down, and they're just going to close the building up and move all the jobs. And uh, the union guys own the refrigerators that are in the break rooms, and they don't want the refrigerators to just get closed up and turned to dust in the, in the factory with everything else, so they want to donate them to St. Vincent de Paul. And I said, that's really nice of those guys to think about others when they're losing their jobs. But how are you going to pick up 12 refrigerators? We only have a pickup truck. And he goes, well, I'll just call the kids from Hackett. And I said, well, better get started if you're doing it tomorrow. So he starts calling the kids, and he's got the list, and he's calling them, and he's telling them there's 12 refrigerators, and they're going, oh, gee, sorry, I've got to go to confession. or <laughs> They can't do it, right? And I tell him, Dean, Dean, don't tell them there's 12 refrigerators. Just tell them you need their help. And he says, no, no, no. Well, he's Lutheran, so he tells the truth. So he, he keeps telling them this. And, and finally, he, he gets one kid, Jeremy. Jeremy says he'll do it. And I said, well, Jeremy's kind of new. He goes, yeah, but he's big. And he's real excited because he lives near the paper mill, and he's always wanted to go inside. And I said, oh, OK. So how are you going to do it still? He says, well, we'll go to the the shop and we'll pick up the two-wheel dolly and then we'll go over there. So that next day he goes to the shop, he picks up the two-wheel dolly and he swings by Jeremy's house and Jeremy comes out of the house and gets in the truck and they drive over to the paper mill which is huge and it's right there, right in his neighborhood. And Dean's talking to him, they got the radio going and, and Dean says to him, well thank your dad for loaning you to me today, I really needed your help and he goes, oh my dad's in prison, he's been there since I was two years old. And Dean's like, go. Oh. Doesn't really know what to say, but they get to the, to the mill. And Jeremy's really excited, because these things, these paper mills are like five stories tall. And all the windows are at the top. And it's just big old beams. They were built 100 years ago. It's really kind of a neat place to, to get inside. And they're waiting outside, and nobody's coming, and nobody's coming. And Dean's wondering if he's in the wrong place. And finally, a little door opens, and a couple of guys come out. And they're looking like this. And they look at Dean, and they're shaking their heads, and they come over and they, they open the gate and they wave him through and he backs the truck up and he hops out. And the guy says to him, didn't they tell you there's 12 refrigerators? And he goes, yeah, yeah, well, I got Jeremy here and we got the pickup truck and we just thought we'd take, you know, three or four trips. And the guys are going, oh, man, all right, come on. So they open the door and there's four of the refrigerators there. So Dean and Jeremy get the dolly and they go over and they wrestle it onto there and they go over to the truck, but there's no ramp, so they got to lift it up onto the truck. And the guys are watching like this, just watching them. And finally, they get it up there, and the guys look at each other, and they go, well, the kid's game anyway. And so they, they decide to help. So they get the other three onto the truck, and then Dean waves, and they go off to the thrift store. And Dean and Jeremy unload the refrigerators at the thrift store, and they drive back. When they get back, the guys say to them, the rest of the refrigerators are all over the plant. We're going to have to go get them. And Jeremy's like, yes, that's what I wanted. I wanted to get in this plant, right? So they start going through the plant. And it's big and dark, and the equipment's all still in there. And these big rollers, great big, huge rollers. And there's these big acid vats. And there's all these gears and shafts. And, and Jeremy's just so excited. And the guys are walking in front of him, just talking. And Jeremy's tugging on Dean's sleeve and saying, What's that thing? What's that thing? And Dean's a chemist. He's going, you know, I work with molecules. I have no idea, Jeremy. <laughs> you got to ask the guys. And Jeremy doesn't want to bother him. So finally, Dean says, guys, guys, Jeremy's got some questions. And so they turn around, and they see this kid. 
And he's just mouth agape, just looking at this. And, and he goes, what's, what's that thing? And the guy looks at it and he goes, oh, that, that's Bertha. You got to work here eight years before they'll let you touch Bertha. You stand next to her in the summer, it's well over 100 degrees. And Jeremy goes, wow, isn't that dangerous? And they go, no, no, this is dangerous. And they're all holding up, they all got fingers missing. And Jeremy's like, oh my goodness, this is just so cool. And the guys are kind of laughing at him, and they start to tell him stories about how the boiler burst in the 1940s, and it nearly shut the plant down. They thought they weren't going to get it going, but the union guys got together. They got the plant up and running within a week. And they show him the twisted beam of when that happened and how many guys died. And they're just telling the stories. And then they said to him, hey, you know what? There's no more rules. You want to go up in the catwalks? And Jeremy goes, yeah. And they go up in the catwalks. And they're up five stories. And they're looking down into the machinery. And the guys are explaining everything to him. Two hours later, they remember they're there to get refrigerators. <laughs> and Dean realizes, you know, it's not about refrigerators. It was about God wanting this young kid who needed time with men and these men who needed to tell the story of what they'd done with their life. And all he needed was somebody who had a pickup truck in order to do that work that God wanted to do. So the work that God does does happen almost by itself. And if we don't hurry them, if we're not in a hurry to get those refrigerators out of there, it happens by itself and we just have to drive the truck. And so that's what the St. Vincent de Paul Society has taught me, that I don't have to be a hero. I don't have to do anything that's even very special. Sometimes I just need to answer the phone, to say a prayer with somebody. And that's all that, that God needs to get his foot in the door. I got that from Maureen and Andy's book, that, that God only needs a small opening. And that's true because I'm never a person who just wants to throw that door open and say, I'm ready, God. Anything you want. I'm not that way. I'm one kind of cracks the door. Okay, I'll give you the small opening. I'll answer the phone. I'll work at the thrift store one day a week. And then God can do amazing things. He just needs that small opening. So the St. Vincent de Paul Society was actually begun by college students. There was a bunch of college students in Paris in the 1830s. And at that time, there was a kind of anti-religious, anti-church feeling going on in, in France. And these kids were trying to do a Bible study. And, and one of the other college students came up to them and said, you know, what difference does it make that there are Christians in this world? How does that change anything? If all the Christians disappeared, would the world be any different? And these college kids said, well, we'll get back with you on that, because they didn't have an answer. And so they went back to their Bible, and they started asking that, themselves that question. And what they figured out was that Jesus spent an awful lot of time with poor people. He was poor himself. He hung around with fishermen who have never been known to be rich. He was with country people. He was with sick people. They're usually poor because of their sickness. So he was with poor people. And so... They thought maybe he was dropping a clue. So they thought, well, we'll just go into the poor neighborhoods and we'll see if he's still there. And he was. They went up to the neighborhood houses where they knew people were struggling, and they knocked on the door, and they started with, what can we do for you? And this table has been sentient, and you still do that. You knock on doors, and you say, what can we do for you? Our, our role as Vincentians is not to change people. Our role is not to fix them. Our role is to be open so that God can do what God wants to do. And so we don't have our plans. God's got the plan. There's really four steps. We're a prayer group, just like the original college students. We pray together. Um, we do that in, as a group. It's important to be a fellowship. You can't do this work on your own. It's not... You're not supposed to be a hero. In fact, it says right in our, the rule of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, we are not fanatics. It's part of our rule. We are not fanatics. We don't do this on our own. We do it in fellowship. The next part is we have to help the poor face to face. We have to meet them because that's where Jesus is. He's there. And if we don't meet them, we're not going to meet Jesus. So we have to meet them face to face. And the, the fourth part is the hardest part for me. We have to help other people help the poor. We're not supposed to do this on our own. We're supposed to make it easy for other people to help the poor. So 
That's where you get thrift stores. Thrift stores are a great way to help other people help the poor. And that's what I discovered um, working there. Um, here's a story that kind of brings all those things into it. One day I answer the phone. So this is my job. And this, I answer the phone and um, actually I don't think I answered a phone. I think Dorothy answered the phone and they wanted to know who was in charge so she just gave me the phone. I wasn't in charge but she didn't want to deal with it. But anyway, it was a nurse at the hospital and she said, um, we've got a patient that we're going to um, release on Saturday, and that's the next day, and she doesn't have a bed at home. And I said, well, we don't have any beds. Nobody donates beds. And she goes, no, no, we've got a bed. But it's in my grandmother's house, and my grandmother's going into assisted living, and we've sold the house, and a furniture dealer is coming and is going to clean all the furniture out of the house today because it's got to be cleaned out today. But there's a bed in there, and this patient needs it, can the St. Vincent of Paul Society go and get that bed today and then deliver it to the patient tomorrow because she's not being released till tomorrow? And I was like, I don't know. We'll see what we can do. So we kind of left it hanging there. So she gave me all the information of the, where the bed was and everything. So then I'm, I'm trying to figure this out, and I get an 80-year-old Vincentian gentleman to help me go and get the bed. We get to the house. It's a nice little brick ranch in the suburbs. And uh, there, sure enough, there's a big truck there where the furniture dealer is going to get all the stuff. And the realtor is there saying, you can have everything in the last bedroom on the right, anything in the bedroom you can take. So I go down there, and it's the guest room. So it's this nice white painted furniture with a single bed, a little dresser, a little bookcase, a little lamp. And Everything's got Laura Ashley ruffles and flowers. It's beautiful, right? It's really nice. So we take garbage sacks and we stuff it all in the garbage sacks and we take the bed apart and we take it all and we get it up on the truck and, and Gene is with me and he's jumping off the back of the truck. I'm going, Gene, Gene, you stay here and I'll, but we get it on there. And then I drive it home and I put it in the garage because I, I need somebody to help me deliver it the next day and Dean's going to do this, but Dean doesn't know this yet because this is pretty new. <laughs> This is when I was new at it. So when he comes home, I'm talking to him about the whole story, and I said, well, we have to deliver it. And he says, well, let's see the address. So I give him the address, and it's like he's going, whoa, that's a tough side of town, Jane. I don't think you and I want to do this on our own. Let me call my friend Dave from work. So Dean calls Dave. So the next day, the three of us get in the truck, and we drive over to this house. And the house is like, the, the address is like, 26 and a half, so you know it's only half the house in the upstairs. And the house is just on the worst part of town. We pull up in front of the house and across the street is this um, windowless van with the back doors open and several young men standing outside the back of the van looking in and doing something. And when we pull up the truck, they close up their van and they turn around and they're looking at us. And Dean says to me, uh, stay in the truck. Dave and I will go up to the door. So Dave and Dean go up to the door of the house across from these guys. And a young man opens the door. He's got no shirt on, and he's looking at these two pharmaceutical scientists on his front porch and the pharmaceutical people across the street. And he's... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you can tell the conversation is animated. I didn't hear the conversation. But anyway, he's indicated that they should go to the back. So Dean and Dave come back, get back in the car, and we drive. And you kind of have to go between the two houses, and it's, it, there's really just room for the truck to go between. And a whole story takes place, which if you want to read that part of the story, you've got to buy the book. But anyway, <laughs> I'm going to skip that. And we get to the back, and it's just gravel and honeysuckle bushes, and there's an enclosed staircase that goes up to the porch. And so Dean and Dave start unloading the truck, and I knock on the door of the enclosed staircase, but there's no way anybody up there is going to hear that. And so I said, Dean, he goes, I'll go ask the guy in the front of the house. So he goes back, and the guy comes out, and, and Dean says, is there any way to get a hold of Anita? That's the woman's name. And he goes, oh, sure. So he stands in the driveway, and he goes, Anita, Anita. And so sure enough, her window comes open, and she looks out, and she goes, what? And he goes, your bed's here. And she goes, my what's here? So apparently the nurse didn't trust us, didn't know we were going get, to get this done. And she says, who are you? And I said, um, we're the St. Vincent de Paul Society, and we've got a bed for you. And she goes, you're what? And Dave goes, don't say it again. Don't say it again. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody's still watching us, you know. 
And I said, well, we've got a bed. And this, this neighbor says, I'll help her get the bed. You guys just leave it there. I'll get it up there for her. And she cusses at him. And she says, no, I'll meet you at the bottom of the stairs. So we come down in the backyard again. And she opens the door. And we start bringing the parts of the bed and everything up. And these neighbors come up, too. And they're running all over the apartment, and they're opening the cupboards, and they're grabbing stuff and sticking it in their pockets. And she's yelling at them, and they're saying, we just left some stuff here. We're just going to get our stuff. We're just going to be out of here in a minute. And, they're, and she's, she's really upset with them, and we're like, we're delivering a bed. That's all we're doing. We're just delivering a bed. And so after the, uh, that, and she keeps yelling at them, I'm kind of just trying to stay out of way. There's a couch that's standing on end in the kitchen between the kitchen and the bedroom door and where she wants us to put the bed. And I said, is there something we could do with that couch? And she says, oh, these people, they're just messing with, with my house the whole time I'm in the hospital. I was in there for a month, and they just used my house for all their badness, and, and, and they just ruined everything. And so that's just wrecked. And I said, well, can we help you with it? And she goes, Why don't you, could you just put it on the street? So Dean and Dave say, yeah. So they take the, bed, the couch, and they wrestle it down. And while they're doing that, I go in the bedroom, and the bedroom it's got gray carpet and gray walls, and it's kind of, there's no furniture in there. There's one ironing board. There's five ashtrays just overflowing on the floor, and that's all there is in this bedroom. So I pick up the ashtrays and dump them all in the garbage in the kitchen, and I kind of pick up the dust bunnies, and there's little pieces of twisted wire and papers, and I just kind of gather that all together and throw it away. And, put the ironing board in the closet, and then I put the bed together, because I took it apart, I know how to put it together, so I put it all together and put the, the, the lamp on the, on the side table, and there's a hot water bottle in there, and get out the Laura Ashley stuff, and, and all of a sudden, it's, it, it looked like a twister before, and now it's like Lilanda Boss. It's like a complete transformation. And she comes back in, Anita comes back in, and she just gasps. She goes, oh! It's beautiful. And Dean and Dave walk in, and they go, oh, yeah, it is. And she goes, and she sits down on the bed, and she starts just smoothing the covers out with her hand. She goes, the nurses gave me this? And I said, yeah, they must have taken a shine to you. And she, and this was the most awkward part for me, she just got into bed. She pulled the covers back, and she got in. <laughs> and I'm like, is there anything else we can get you? Can I? Can I buy some groceries for you or pick up some medicine? She goes, no, no, the visiting nurses are coming tomorrow. All I needed was a bed. She said, my whole life I've never had my own bed before. And Dean and Dave and I are like, oh, wow. And so I kind of just, I just pulled the covers up and I said, anything else you need? She goes, no, just lock the door when you leave. She says, I am so blessed. God is so good. And I was, I was just amazed. I've never said that when I got into bed. I've always had a bed. I just expect to get into bed. And now every night when Dean and I go to bed, we say, we are so blessed. God is so good. Because we had no idea how blessed we were until we met Anita. So prayer and fellowship, helping the four. Face-to-face, the face-to-face part is essential. How would I have learned that if I hadn't gone into her house and met her? Um, And giving other people a chance to help the poor. Dave doesn't go to church, and he's got reasons. Church hurt him sometime in his past, and and, uh, he read this book when it came out, and he says, you know, Jane, I like that book. I'd give it to other people. And so there's a lot of reasons to be doing this work, a lot of, a lot of reasons to help our, ourselves grow. Um, the question I get most often when I talk to people about helping the poor is, how do you know if they're telling you the truth? How do you know if they're going to use it for drugs or alcohol? How do you know if you're really helping them? And I think, I think we're just all terrified that Jesus in one of his disguises is lying to us. Because that's really Jesus in the poor. And the St. Vincent of Paul Society teaches us it's important to try to believe people. They usually aren't believed. And it's really important for us to try to believe them. 
one day a woman came in with her husband, and she was dressed pretty nice. In fact, um, really nice. And, and her, her fingernails looked like they cost more than my shoes. And I'm thinking, what does she need? And they sit down in the office of the thrift store, and she starts explaining that they're homeless, that they had to leave their town in the hurry, and that this so it's just bad people in that town. And then she had to take her mother, and so she's got her mother with her, and that they had to put all their furniture in storage. And they've been in Kalamazoo for a week, and they've been in the homeless shelter. But now those people at the homeless shelter are so unreasonable, they're kicking them out. And I'm thinking, people at our homeless shelter are not that unreasonable. They don't kick people out unless there's reason for it. But I don't say anything. I'm trying not to judge. Don't judge. Don't judge. And then she says that she went down to the Department of Human Services, and they told her that she had the best worker there, but it was a lie because that worker was so rude and so mean to her that um, she had to really put her foot down and, and let people know what terrible service she was getting. And so she, they escorted her out with the security guards. And, but people knew about it. And then she's telling me that she's suing the state of Michigan. And I'm thinking, how am I going to get this woman out of the thrift store? <laughs> <You know. laughs> I am not believing a word she's telling me. It all sounds like exaggeration to me and pure victimhood, and I'm just not believing it. But there is no reason for me not to help her. She's never had help from us before. She's new to town. She needs help getting into an apartment. She doesn't have enough money for it. She's got that, all the paperwork right. And so, you know, I, I finally, I just fill out a, I listen to her story, and I fill out a promissory note, and I hand it to her, and I say, here, this is a promissory note for $150, and if you can find some other churches to help you with the rest of the um, security deposit and first month's rent, come back here, and we will pay this directly to the landlord. Do you have any questions? And she takes the note, and she looks at it, and she says, well, this is very nice. And then she started crying, and the tears just poured out of her eyes. She, was, she couldn't push them away with her fingers. She had to push them away with the palms of her hand. And her husband looks at her. He's been quiet the whole time. He looks at her. He's like, what's wrong with you? And he pulls out a, a handkerchief and gives it to her. And she goes, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I, this is very nice of you. Oh, my goodness, I don't know what's going on. And it's just getting her shirt wet. And I'm going, is there anything I can do for you? Are you all right? And she goes, yeah, I'm fine. I, I don't know what's wrong. I'm going to have to leave, but thank you very much for the money. And she stood up, and they left. And I realized that maybe she'd never been believed before, and it broke her heart. And it, whether I believed her or not didn't matter. That all I had to do was show her just the smallest trust here, we're going to help you if you can get some other help. And it broke her heart. And I didn't need security guards. So what God wants accomplished will happen almost by itself. In 1617, St. Vincent de Paul preached a, a parish mission in France. And he was such a good preacher that people were lined up for, to go to confession and he had to call on the Jesuits from a nearby town to come. And all these Jesuits came to hear the confessions. Um, this book is, uh, is about Vincentian spirituality, Thrift Store Saints. And when I first was um, sending it to publishers to try and get it published, um, one of the editors at another publishing house said, let me send it to Loyola Press. They're looking for a book on Ignatian spirituality written by a woman. And I said, well... This is not Ignatian spirituality. This is Vincentian spirituality. She goes, yeah, but you're a woman. Let's see if this will work. <laughs> well, it did. It did. <laughs> so when the book came out last, uh, last year, I wanted to celebrate at the thrift store. And so I went to my, my local parish where I go to church, and there's a guy who makes donuts every Sunday. And I said, would you help me make donuts? He goes, sure. How many do you want? I said, how about 150? He goes, OK, let's make donuts. So the night before the book came out, I went to the, the church kitchen, and we made 150 donuts. And I took them in, and I put them in the back room of the St. Vincent de Paul Society. And 
we had told the neighborhood and all our shoppers that this book was coming out. And so people were coming in and I was signing the books. I had a little table set up at the front. We were staying open a little later. Usually we close at three. We we're staying open till six that night. And um, after a while, some of the neighborhood kids come in and they go, hey, why are you still open? Usually you're closed. There's a bunch of little kids. Actually, there were only two of them when they first came in. And I said, well, we're having a, a special party um, because this book came out. And, and they said, a book? You're having a party about a book? And I said, yeah, there's donuts in the back. You want some donuts? And they go, yeah. So they go to the back. They come back with donuts. And they go, we're going to go get our friends. So they go, and then a whole bunch of kids come in. So we get all the neighborhood kids are coming in. There's maybe eight of them. And they all go to the back, and they all get a stack of donuts. So they got their donuts stacked up. And they're eating them, and they come back, and I'm talking to people and signing the books, and they stack their donuts up on the table where I'm talking, and they're eating them one at a time, watching me talk to people and everything. And when there's a little break, one of the, one of the little kids says, so, so did you make this book? And I said, well, I, I wrote the book, but uh, some people in Chicago made it. And they went, oh, well, what's it about? And I said, well, it's about this thrift store. And the kids look at each other and they go. Some people in Chicago made a book about this thrift store. And I said, yeah. And they go, thanks for the donuts. And they were going. <laughs> they didn't really believe that. Well, I guess I'm not that good of a storyteller. <laughs> they were good donuts. OK. So. In the, in the world of St. Vincent de Paul, I want to show you what I usually look like. You guys have these? This is how we do Christianity. We put on aprons because it's kind of messy at a thrift store. And none of us are trying to do it ourselves. We all take our time and we pray. Um, we try not to hurry God's work. All we're really committed to doing is answering the phone and driving the truck. And what God accomplishes is just amazing. And it's not only what he accomplishes in the world, but he accomplishes it inside of our souls. Because you can't live these stories and listen to these, these people with Jesus inside of them without being changed. So I thank you very much for inviting me here today. I'm... I'm going to answer your questions if you'd like, but I put the apron on so that you realize I answer questions about working in a thrift store. I'm not really into theology or anything like that. <laughs> I'm, this is Vincentian spirituality, and, and it's all about putting your sleeves up and putting on aprons. And thank you very much for coming today. Appreciate it. Oh. If, any, if anybody wants to raise your hand, I'll run a mic over because we got we're recording this with a question, maybe a comment, a response, uh, something you want to say to Jane. Uh, we've got just a f maybe ten minutes to do this, and then uh, she'll be available to uh, sign some books or meet people, and you can meet Dean afterwards too. He's uh, wonderful too. <laughs> Please, anybody? Janine. Thank you. I'm, this is really timely for me because I've been listening to someone in Appalachia who works, who's developing a homeless mission there. And these people are really called. Uh, but how do the homeless help each other through your your organization. Can you give some examples? Yeah, they're, they're always helping each other, which is one of the reasons they always have financial problems. <laughs> they, they really are so generous with each other. We, we're running this thrift store, and we've got things priced at very low prices, right? And we've got a, a jar on the table that says, pennies for priests, it's for the uh, seminarians, you know? And these people, they're buying something for 2 or $3, and then we give them their change, and they throw it in this jar for the priests. And we're like, they're not even Catholic. What are they doing? But they just do this. They just they give. They help each other all the time. 
Um, and that's the other very inspiring part about it. You feel really small sometimes when you see how generous they are with each other. That you think, why am I, why am I holding back? But, yeah. Anybody else? Pat? I read your book. It's great. Thank you. And I, one of the things that struck me is whether you had a, a feeling or calling. I mean, do you think there are a lot of people that have a gnawing about volunteerism or being helpful, but they don't know how to channel it or they don't know how to respond to it? I mean, I really felt like you, there was something calling you when you first went into the thrift store to buy some religious articles, and then you got kind of called into that and do you think most people just ignore it or they don't hear it that the call to do something or be something different in their lives well I was in severe denial I kept trying to get out of there remember in the story I did not want to do that I had been praying to God saying you know my life is too busy it doesn't feel like I'm doing anything right I'm doing everything halfway raising the kids teaching it's like everything's too much of a rush you know, and I, don't, I didn't feel very good about what I was doing, so I was, I'd been praying to God, you know, show me, is this really what you want me to do and be doing, or is there something else? And then I walked in the thrift store, and Dorothy tried to talk me into it. I'm going, no, this is not what God wants me to do. I am, I have, I'm a busy person, and I have a lot of other talents, and I don't want to sort clothing, right? But the way Dorothy interacted with that man and how she stayed peaceful when he was angry and rude and drunk. And then when, when he was gone and she turned to me and she used almost the identical phrases with me, I was like, I'm a problem customer. I have a credit card, you know? So <laughs> I realized it was just so eye-opening. It was like, oh, for crying out loud. Okay, I'll help for a little while, you know? But that was 17 years ago. Because once you get in there and you realize this is transformational, this is what Christianity is for me. This is what it is. This is meeting Jesus. And so I don't know what other people's situations are. I, I know that we've had a lot of volunteers come in kind of reluctantly and end up just as committed as I am. And it's wonderful to see it happen. And in, I've learned to be patient with them because some, they, they're like I was. And Dorothy was very patient. And Dean... Dean. Yeah, to add, add to that? I just, Jane told the story of Jeremy early on, and to, to this uh, lady's question, one of the privileges I have is doing most of the pickups and deliveries with high school and college volunteers. And that's what's cool about being here at Creighton and seeing the college students in attendance, because a lot of times among our youth, we just haven't asked them to help. And once we invite them, Usually uh, the, the guys I ask have to have a little bit of muscle to them, so they'll be sophomores or juniors in high school. And they usually have to do five or ten hours of volunteer work per marking period. If I get them to do one Saturday, they're hooked. And I have them go way over the number of hours. They continue not only until they graduate from high school, but I have guys who've gone away to college in California who will come back and they say, they'll call us up and say, hey, Mr. Knuth, are you doing that again this Saturday? One of them now who started with us, runs the Goodwill at another city in Michigan. Another young man has started what I think will become the 21st century version of the St. Vincent de Paul Society. He is modeling it after a Vincentian from the early part of the 1900s named Pier Giorgio. And he started that up in California. And he's gone back to the, colleg the collegians to really invigorate that and put it in new shape. So we just have to remember to invite and ask and not assume. Yeah, and when one of our college students was, who had been helping regularly, I said, I'm going to go to the high school and, and talk to the religion classes about volunteer for St. Vincent Paul. Would you come along and tell them? What, and he's kind of a quiet guy, and he doesn't talk a lot. And he goes, sure, I'll come. So he came, and I would give the, the whole talk about St. Vincent Paul and then open it up for questions. And one of the high school kids looked at Scott, and he says, Scott, you don't need service hours anymore. Why are you still doing this? And Scott goes, because I can, I can lift a couch, I can move a refrigerator, why wouldn't you do it if you can do it? Not everybody can do that. And these high school kids were like, oh, 
I thought, what an answer. I do it because I can. Not everybody can. That was beautiful. I thought, oh, he really gets it. Please, Tim. Hello. Hello. Um, I don't know much of your history, so I apologize. I just uh, saw this luncheon and thought it would sound like a really neat idea. Um, did you actually, you're, you're a volunteer, did you have to leave your job and all that kind of stuff? I mean, you have financial obligations, obviously, you have children, you have a home. How did you make it all work to go and it sounds like this is your life now, is, is that correct? Is this what you yeah. do? Well, I, I only volunteer once a week. You're not supposed to be a hero. Okay. If you're there too much, you kind of get into other people's business and, and stuff. So we kind of have a rule, once a week is enough. Okay. Um, no, it's not all I do, but um, yes, you have to take a step back from that kind of busy life I was leading. And I was too busy. And I was, I was raising the kids, and they were young. They were 8 and 10, and I was teaching part-time. I was at the community college teaching math at the time. And so I would be running out of class, and my students would be saying, well, wait, I needed to ask you some questions. And I'm saying, I'm sorry, i got to pick my kids up at school. And I'd get to school, and the teacher's mad because I'm late, and the teachers had to wait with my kids. And so, and I'm a teacher, so I know how that feels. And so then I pick up the kids, and I get them in the car. And there was one day that was very close to this time, and I'm driving home, and I'm one of the kids says something, and I snap back at her, and she goes, did you work today, Mommy? And I was like, yeah. Oh, OK. It's like they knew, don't push Mommy on the day she was working. And I thought, oh, for crying out loud. So I just didn't feel good about it. I wasn't doing those jobs well. And what St. Vincent taught me was slow down. You don't have to do it all. I was, I was kind of raised that you had to do it all. You had to have the happy family, and you had to have a career. And St. Vincent taught me that, no, you don't have to do it all. And I have this wonderful husband who says, yeah, we don't need you grumpy. And, and he let me cut back. So I've, I've continued teaching off and on over the years, but I never went back full time. So yeah, you, you make those kinds of changes in your life when you want to get this part into it. There's, there's no room for all of it. Yeah. We thank you, Jane, for taking the risk to be here and to tell us stories that move our hearts and, uh, and invite us to uh, not be heroes, but open that door a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me.